This revolutionary recording is presented to you in a round sound. It was recorded with whatever was lying around. Lady, don't take no shit. Insist don't respect the sister. Walk around like a woman. If she won't speak, less is something worth saying. Don't play. The girl take herself so serious. People stare curious. She's got a natural way. Her hips way furious. Yeah, the luxurious. Carries herself like the cutest, most prettiest thing you've seen this side of the bay. Hey, this is Lady Don't Take No your weekly roundup of all of the real and none of the fake. I'm your host, Alicia Garza. This show is pro-Black, pro-queer, proudly feminist, and pro-do-what-you-like. Every week, you're going to get the best of what goes on in my head, what we're loving on, what we're hating on, what we might be, what we ain't going to do, politics, pop culture, rebellion. We cover it all. We are recording from Oakland, California, the center of the known universe, where we are all on Rona quarantine. It's a weird time. It's a scary time. It's all the kinds of time. But don't worry. We're going to help you understand the dynamics of this time every single week. So be sure to tune in, tell a friend, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We do it for the culture, so the pod is free 99, because we know that with a country in chaos, the least we could do is keep you from putting your money anywhere else than where it's actually needed. Our guest this week is the host of Truthout's podcast, Movement Memos, and a contributing writer at Truthout. Her written work can also be found in Teen Vogue, Bustle, Yes Magazine, her own blog, Transformative Spaces, and many, many other excellent places. She's the co-founder of the direct action collective, Lifted Voices. She was honored for good work in 2014 with the Women to Celebrate Award, and in 2018 with the Chicago Freedom School's Champions of Justice Award. I'm really thrilled that she's here with us today. Please, please, please give us a warm, lady don't take no introduction to the one, the only, Kelly Hayes. What's going on, Kelly? Hi there, Alicia. It's great to be here today. It's so good to have you. And, you know, honestly, there's everything in the world going on right now. And so this could not be a better time to have a conversation with one of my favorite strategists, organizers, practitioners, deep thinkers, and like, get yourself (laughs) together, (laughs) Urs. So thank you. Thank you for showing up. And, you know, I ask every guest, you know, quarantine life has been wild. So I'm curious to hear, what has your quarantine life been like? And have you developed any unique habits live and direct from Miss Rona? You know, um, my quarantine life is a lot like my life before, only that it's missing a lot of fun parts. (laughs) Is, you know, I have a full-time day job and I pretty much also pull full-time organizing on top of that. So I'm always toting my computer around, always messaging people, you know, always tweeting. So a lot of the things are the same. It's a really high stress time, you know, even before the recent unrest began, the coronavirus created such a crisis in our communities that mutual aid work has been constant, uh, troubleshooting has been constant. So it's a lot of me like coasting from the bed to the couch with the laptop and occasionally managing to get some exercise. Mm. Okay, so I've been following also the chronicles of Charlie the cat. Is that correct? <laughs> a little Cam the cat. I'm sorry, little Cam the cat. Who... No, Charlie's the my husband. <laughs> I'm like, like, well, both very cuddlesome. (laughs) But Cam, Cam the cat has some really fascinating and fantastic politics. So tell me about Cam the cat, please. You know, she's a bit radical. Mm -hmm. Just a little. (laughs) She's maybe a bit more radical than me. (laughs) Her sort of internet presence kind of uh, grew out of originally me wanting to say something kind of harsh to people about something they were doing wrong and kind of scold people. And so I tried to soften it up. Cam delivered the message (laughs) on on Facebook and Twitter. (laughs) That's hilarious. That is hilarious. Nobody gets mad at a radical cat. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Well, it's also sad. Sounds like um, what's also real is that Cam the Cat sounds like my notes section in my phone. (laughs) 
<laughs> and that is where I put all the rants, all the raves, all the shade. And I'm like, you know, put it here and then come back to it in an hour. And if you still really want to do it, fucking go for it. <laughs> That's a good system. You know, you know, that one's courtesy of my homegirl, Celeste, who I hope is listening today. So, Kelly, you're a voice online. I mean, you're an actual person in real life. but You're also a voice <laughs> online that I personally really, really appreciate. I think you are clear, focused, and sans bullshit, as they say. Tell me a little bit more about how you got into organizing. Well, I got really into community work, I would say, around 2010 and 2011. I had been involved with some some different things in my 20s, mm -hmm. but had kind of stepped back from activism. And then Occupy happened. Mm. And I had, had been building different community relationships at that time, uh, doing some work around my own neighborhood. And I got pulled into that piece just to kind of try to bring some skills to the table. There were things I knew how to do. So I was stepping in and just offering up some help where I could, some guidance for some new folks who were trying to learn how to make the things happen. Mm -hmm. And things just kind of kept evolving from there. You find good people to work with. You do cool things together. And, you know, you find that energy. And then you start making allies and friends and connections in other groups. And so it's always been a really organic process for me. I'm, I'm good at building relationships with people. And when there's work that needs to be done and you have relationships, you know, you kind of just find your role. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot happening in this country right now. And... Already this week, as a non-crier who is totally fine with crying, <laughs> I have burst into tears no fewer than, I don't know, 15 times in the last 24 hours. Not because I'm at all shocked about what I'm seeing, but because it feels so dangerous and so preventable. Um, so just this week, Trump tear gassed protesters so that he could take a photo op. But his photo op was much more sinister than that. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the impacts of the actions that Trump has taken this week, both along the lines of declaring Antifa as a terrorist organization, but also this photo op also had implications. And so I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that. So I think it's really important to understand these developments in terms of their role in a larger march to fascism that has been ongoing uh, throughout Trump's presidency and really that the stage was being set for long before his arrival. We kind of allowed a lot of presidents to, you know, sort of create rules for themselves. Like Obama opened a lot of doors to unilateral military power mm -hmm. for a president. Mm -hmm. And folks didn't freak out about that because they had some amount of faith in him and the way he would execute that. But, you know, the problem with that is there's always a next somebody who comes into power. And, you know, I personally didn't approve of the way Obama handled the military. But obviously, like, we're in a completely different level now. Mm -hmm. And with this threat to bring in the military into the states and to do so not at the request of governors because there's some kind of catastrophe, but to overrule them and supersede state power because they are, quote, not dominating the streets enough. This is a massive escalation. This takes us much, much closer to full-blown fascism than we were a short time ago. And what we're really seeing in COVID-19 is an accelerant. A lot of things that were already in a bad way and heading down a bad path are now barreling down that path. Mm -hmm. Like we have fascist objectives are being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people are, I shouldn't say not a lot of people, but not nearly enough people are noticing mm -hmm. because folks are caught up in survival right now and folks are caught up in the loudest thing in the news cycle at any given time. So while people are paying attention to things that I wouldn't call distractions because they're important things, but they're looking at that one thing. And while they're looking at that one thing, 10 other scary things are happening, such as immigrant folks being deported. Right. Like there were Central American countries that tried to shut down any incoming folks because of COVID-19 and forced, Trump forced them to allow the deportations to continue. So we know that COVID-19 is wreaking havoc in prisons and detention centers. So we have all of these immigrant folks who are contracting COVID-19 in detention and then being piled into planes and sent to their home countries, and they're causing outbreaks there. So we have Trump waging biological warfare, like unchecked, against these folks. 
a lot of indigenous folks, which is in the worst and ugliest traditions of this country. And we have folks dying in prisons and dying in detention centers. So there we have fascist objectives being fulfilled across the board. And now with this crisis that's occurred because of the rebellions that are happening, we see another level of escalation. And I want folks to understand that that was always going to happen um, once we hit this COVID situation and we failed to get meaningful financial relief. Mm -hmm. It was only a matter of time before something popped off in the streets. It just so happens that the police decided to murder a black man, you know, in this in that particular moment, in that particular public way. And so that wound up being the spark. But really, like, folks are staring down hunger. Folks abide government because it either gives them something for their obedience or because they feel they have more to lose by opposing it. Mm -hmm. Those dynamics have been in jeopardy for a minute. So... We were going to get here, but the fact that it's happening the way it is, the fact that we're talking about Black liberation and Black folks are already a highly scapegoated community, the escalation we're going to see here is fierce and it's going to continue to get worse. You know, I think a lot of people don't actually understand what fascism is. It's a word that not only is unfamiliar to a lot of folks, but I also think sometimes it gets thrown around colloquially, right? But now we're actually in a period that is showing many of the dimensions of fascism. And so I'm wondering if you can make it just real plain for our listeners. And I know you've done couple episodes on this, actually, of Movement Memos, which I want people who are listening right now to take a look at and to take a listen because you do a really great job um, and your guests do a great job of like breaking down things very simply so that people can understand it. But for our listeners, if you could just talk a little bit about what is fascism and what is it not? So fascism is, it's one of those things that's really hard to put in a nutshell, but in a, to attempt to do that, we're talking about far-right, authoritarian, ultra-nationalist governments and movements. But it's more than that, because I think a lot of times people think fascism and they think authoritarianism. It's like, well, it's not simply tyranny. It's tyranny that is reinforced by a mass movement. Uh, fascism is a participatory sort of thing. It can't happen, you know, like someone's clever and they take over the government and now they have a fascist government. There have to be lots and lots of people that get behind the ideology and behind the leadership. Mm. And the reasons that they do that are basically that fascist leaders tell people that their impulses are correct and they are the real victims. Everything else is sourced from there. Mm. Like you get folks who want to blame their problems on other people. They want to believe there was a time when people like them had it better than this. They want to believe that everything wrong in their life is happening because of these people that they already have biases against. Those people are, in fact, picking their pockets. Those people are, in fact, a threat to their family. And, you know, violent impulses are justified. Redemptive violence okay. is justified. And as time goes on and that fervor becomes more powerful and props up the leadership more and more, ethical constraints start to slip away on government and eventually legal constraints start to slip away on government. I mean, basically, you wind up with a government you don't recognize anymore. And so we have been for some time in the ethical constraints are long gone piece, and we've been an ongoing process of the, the legal constraints kind of coming off the wheels. I mean, this is describing exactly what we are experiencing right now. And I think what I know is that when I talk to people in my life who are generally liberal, the minute that you start to talk about fascism and its dynamics, I don't know if it's because they're like scared to embrace it or if because they really don't see it, but they say, no, 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 no. Right. <laughs> I mean, he is bad. You know, he's not the person that we want, but all we got to do is vote in November. This happens every so often and, you know, let the process work kind of shit. Um, <laughs> what would you say in response to those folks who say, look, I mean, I don't agree with Trump in relationship to his racism, but, you know, he's not that bad. And actually, every four years, we have an opportunity to change it. So no big deal. Everybody just keep calm and vote. What would you say in relationship to that? 
Well, the first thing I would say is bold of you to assume there's going to be an election. Correct. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Because I do not have that confidence. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that it's easy for people to only pay attention to pieces of politics, even those of us who are politically engaged. You know, people who we think of as knowing a lot about politics maybe know a lot about a few different areas of politics or some particular mechanisms and how they work. Most of us, you know, we're we're not well-versed in everything. And so I wasn't super well-versed in fascism when Trump came into office. But Ajaris Dixon and I, you know, had our panic attack together about the fact that he was elected and said, you know, we need to do a deep dive. We need to figure this out. We need to map out what's happening. We need to know what we need to teach our communities and what we need to know to stay safe. And at that time, our conversations were revolving around a lot of when do we run? Mm -hmm. Is there a point at which we need to get the heck out of Dodge? You know, at the very least, you know, if we don't leave the country, personally, I'm not a person who could afford to just leave the country. Do I just kind of slip away and, you know, live a much less visible life somewhere? At what point is it not safe to be a person who has the connections that I have politically, who does the work that I do, who writes the kind of content I write? And Honestly, we created that checklist like, you know, we started creating that sort of map a long time ago and several times over we've gotten to points where we said this is the breaking point. At this point, we know things are going to spiral out of control Mm -hmm. and, you know, just didn't act because we're all kind of frogs in the pot. We're all kind of negotiating with reality as it comes and also very busy trying to manage the constant emergencies because that's part of how fascism works, too. It keeps us off center. Like, it's part of the whole thing. It's it's shock and awe. It's sudden strikes of violence. It's terror. And it keeps people from regrouping. Mm -hmm. Because even though fascism is a mass movement, there are way more of us. Mm -hmm. And what prevents us from beating them is that we don't exist in connection with each other. So they don't want to give us the space in which to make those, you know, to to figure that out and to start doing the hard work of building connections that aren't there. So they keep us in defensive mode constantly, constantly defending ourselves. So they don't they want to keep us from coming together. Yes, they do. And I think that folks are in a lot of denial in a way that is dangerous because they want to believe that institutions can save us. We have a lot of secular folk in this country, and they want to put their faith somewhere. They want to hold something sacred and think something's always going to be there for them. We're we're social animals. It's in our nature to look for, for something that we can rely on, some leadership that is steady. And it's just not real anymore. Those things, these institutions they cherish are Nazi occupied. None of the rules are coming to save us. And that's not to say that the election definitely will not happen. It's not to say that Trump will successfully, like, you know, derail it. But it's very possible. And we don't really have much of a chance of stopping that if people don't acknowledge that it's possible. So much of what you've said here is deeply important to me, both as somebody who stands alongside you in this movement and who raises my voice alongside you in this movement to really talk about not only what's wrong in this country, but what we can do better and what we need to do right. It's a scary time for those of us who do that because, right, under fascist regimes, under, see, it doesn't even want to come out of my mouth, (laughs) under fascist regimes, One of the core and primary targets, right, is press, journalists um, and platforms, right, that that try to facilitate the free and clear circulation of information, particularly if it's information that is antithetical to information that government is trying to put out under those conditions. Let me talk to you about Antifa, because I get really frustrated again with the ways in which our movements get flattened into violent and nonviolent, legitimate and not legitimate, peaceful and not peaceful. I mean, there's all kinds of bullshit categories that um, our movement gets boxed into. So similarly to what I hear sometimes about 
you know, a few years ago, people were up in arms about the Black Bloc. And I was like, well, what the fuck is that? That's not an organization. <laughs> it's a series of tactics, right? Like anybody could use Black Bloc tactics, right? And it's not confined to one particular grouping of folks. And it's not an organization. Similarly, with Antifa, who we've heard a lot about over really the last couple of years as this administration has kind of tried to make an example out of and give a name to, right, what they call far left extremists, right? But I always say and feel deeply that words mean things and it's important to use them correctly. (laughs) Yes. Antifa stands for anti-fascist. And you've talked about fascism being a real danger to this country. So technically, if we really want to see a country where there is a full and robust democracy, where there isn't fascism, where there isn't authoritarianism, wouldn't we all be Antifa? Absolutely. And that is something that people need to get through their heads. Kind of like you were talking about, people are uncomfortable with the word fascism and they get tripped out when you say it. Mm -hmm. Very much the same, right, about Antifa. People get tripped out. And both of those things are dangerous. It is very dangerous for us not to be able to discuss fascism. Not having the imagination to be able to picture things getting worse is just as dangerous as not having the imagination to picture them getting better. Mm -hmm. When we talk about Antifa, it is tremendously, tremendously harmful that folks see anti-fascism as the enemy. Folks don't know the history. Folks haven't dived into this. They don't understand why this exists the way that it does. This, this is all rooted in histories of people who actually opposed fascists in countries where fascism fully ascended. These ideas, these practices were developed by people who knew that you had to deplatform fascists. You simply cannot allow them to organize. I know people love these ideas about free speech in this country and everyone gets an opinion. Fascism isn't an opinion. It's a death-making force. And when you allow that death-making force to escalate, you're going to lose control of it. I, I really feel strongly that Nazis should be deplatformed. Fascists should be deplatformed. They should not be able to organize in public. They should not be comfortable talking about their ideas around everyday people. I really think that there needs to be a cost to being a fascist, whether it's social, economic, or whatever. I don't think they should get to live in peace. That said, those tactics, deplatforming and the kind of in your face stuff that Antifa does, is not the totality of anti fascism. Like, I consider my work anti-fascist. And, I mean, you've seen my protests. They're very artful. They're very colorful. They're usually very Mm family-friendly. And that's still anti-fascist work. And so folks need to not only get comfortable with the idea of anti-fascism and with that word, but also get comfortable being in alignment with it and understanding that maybe their anti-fascism doesn't look like getting in people's faces or wearing a mask or whatever. But the actions they take to undermine the ascent of fascism are anti-fascism. And they should take pride in that. And they should feel good about that. And that should be a banner they want for the whole community. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Kelly, you have a most excellent, most needed, most timely podcast out right now called Movement Memos. So talk with us a little bit about what inspired you to do this podcast? And what do you want people to do with your pod? Well, you know, I got into journalism like quite by accident uh, because we weren't getting the kind of coverage that told our stories. Mm-hmm. When we, I would see amazing protests happen in the street and then I would read the newspaper the next day and it was just dreadful. So I started a blog and I started doing my own coverage of what was happening with movements and protests. And over time, wound up working at Truth Out and also managed to uh, wind up contributing to the anthology, Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? Police Violence and Resistance in the United States, which I mentioned because it is available free now as an ebook. Indeed. From Haymarket as a resource for folks because of the unrest that's happening. So I wanted to name that that's a piece. But Truth Out has been really great to me. I started as a paid intern wound up having a fellowship and eventually became a union staff member. And I was just doing contributing writing and working on social media. And last year, my supervisor came to me and asked me if I wanted to develop a podcast for Truth Out. 
And I almost said no, because I was very comfortable with the job that I had. And I had a schedule that I knew I could manage with the organizing work that I do. And I just, I'm not accustomed to taking on things that I don't feel like I even know how to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Like, I'm still making it up as I go along with this damn podcast. <laughs> That's how this goes. <laughs> Just so our listeners know, this is how this goes. <laughs> but the uh, the reason I said yes is, for one thing, it's hard to turn down a bullhorn. You know, that's what social media is to me in general. That's why I cultivated the presence that I did. It really just allows me to deliver words and information to a broader section of folk and, like, what organizer doesn't want that. But in terms of The way that the show works and its content, it's actually all derived from an idea that uh, Lauren Walker, who's an amazing black woman illustrator who works at Truth Out, and I had a couple of years ago for a zine that we wanted to create. We wanted to create a zine called Movement Memos that would have sort of each month kind of stories from the front lines and tidbits that organizers doing work on issues wanted people to understand about what was happening with their work. And, you know, after Trump got elected, it just zines seemed really important to me because in part because once I started studying fascism, I really developed a new respect for all the socialist newspapers and all the folks that folks tend to make fun of them. If they're at protests, they're giving out their newspapers. But I really began to understand the revolutionary importance of that Mm -hmm. and that a lot of the early resistance work in France, it was all just newspapers. It was people Mm -hmm. creating, you know, records of dissent and telling those stories. And so I liked the idea of coming up with with a zine that, you know, had that sort of our spin on that. But, you know, life is busy. We just never managed to make it happen because crisis after crisis kept getting in the way. So I've tried to translate that idea into this audio format. And in addition to sort of like editorializing the way I do, I think that my... Uh, Colleagues at Truth Out were kind of hoping to capture some of that stuff that I do for free on Facebook when I just go off (laughs) and (laughs) they'd see all these shares happening and think like, we want these shares. (laughs) So I think they partly wanted a vehicle for that editorializing piece, but like me ranting about fascism and whatever else. But most importantly to me is I get to talk to people who are doing important work and get their stories into the hands and ears of folks who could potentially be doing that work. Because truth out, you know, I love what we do because I think we create the kind of news content and analysis that fuels movements happening. Like people need shit that doesn't come from the fucking MSN and all their bullshit. We can't trust the corporate news. It exists in opposition to our prosperity, to our freedom, to us actually understanding the world around us. So to have a publication that actually does that kind of work Mm -hmm. It was crucial to me to, you know, to embody that in the podcast, but take it to the next level. I don't just want the podcast to give people information that helps them do better activism. I want to help people make the jump from, okay, I'm passionate about this information and this story. And now this person is giving me an idea of what it would mean to cross into this work. I love that. This makes me so happy because what I think your pod does is it gives us hope. Things that we don't understand, things that we can't make sense of, things that we're getting misinformation and disinformation about, I think it makes us feel disempowered to take action. I know for myself, as a resident Capricorn, one thing I can tell you for sure (laughs) is if I understand the background and the basis to something, it's like I feel freed up to imagine what the possibilities are for change. And so I just want to add my voice to the chorus of people who I hope tell you this all the time, Kelly, but damn, thank you. Um, Your voice and your analysis, your way of getting people focused on what really fucking matters (laughs) is so, so critical right now. Last but not least, we're in the midst of a rebellion. That's just a fact. And most would say that you know, without using the cliche, right? Justice delayed is justice denied. And when it comes to Black communities and police violence, and not just Black communities, but definitely Black communities (laughs) and police violence and state-sanctioned violence of all forms, we have been denied justice. And we are now in the midst of a rebellion that is a human response to being denied 
the things that you need to live well, and then also being attacked when you demand it. I have not seen the likes of this in my lifetime, which is saying a lot because I feel like my lifetime has been full of rebellions from the LA uprising to the Oscar Grant protests to Occupy Oakland, right? <laughs> the second largest encampment outside of Zuccotti Park to Black Lives Matter to Standing Rock. Like my life has been full of rebellions and I have never seen, I have never seen uprising at this scale and I've never seen conditions so sharp. There's a lot of people asking about what they can do in quotes in this moment. And I'll admit, I cringe a little bit when people ask me that. Not because I think that it's bad that people don't know what they can do, but because I suspect that when people ask this, they want an easy answer. And frankly, I don't have an easy answer right now. The easiest thing I can say <laughs> is join the movement. I can't tell you to press a button. I can't tell you about one phone call you can make to make this go away, that actually we've got to invest in building power. And so I know you're getting these questions too. And what do you say, Kelly, to the people who ask you about how to get involved, where to start, and how to be helpful right now? Give us your top three things that you would encourage people to do in this moment, even if they aren't easy answers? Well, the first thing I would say is that we have a unique opportunity in terms of learning that most of us didn't have when we got into the work and had to really start picking up skill sets, which is that because of quarantine, so many trainings are happening online. Mm -hmm. So organizing 101, it's for everybody. I don't care if you're already experienced. I don't care if you've already worked on three campaigns. Everyone needs Organizing 101. Even if you wind up throwing out the rule book, I think that, you know, we should all read it first. We don't know what we don't know. So I would tell folks to get trained up in everything that they can, take advantage of this moment and the fact that this stuff is accessible when it usually isn't. Because, you know, people put on these trainings at like the Highlander Center or whatever. It's like you have to actually get there. You have to be able to take, you know, days out of your life. That's right. We're in a position right now to build up a lot of skill sets very quickly. So I think people would be doing a great thing for their community if they started picking up those skills so they could start sharing them around and deconsolidating that knowledge too. In terms of other things folks can do, start building relationships, you know, actual relationships with folks doing the work. You know, I don't ask folks like one time for a one-time thing I can do. I keep up with what folks are working on. I ask if there are ways I can help with specific things that are happening. And people want that help. If it's just a little thing, it might be like, oh, well, you have access to, you know, these documents that are behind a paywall. Can mm -hmm. you get them for us? There are so many tiny contributions people can make that are actually massive in That's terms right. of the impact, in terms of what couldn't happen without them. So I really want people to commit to the understanding that there is something they can do and that feeling disempowered about how they can participate is a choice. Mm -hmm. That's a, a choice not to dig deeper and figure out what they have to give. So definitely make a choice to have a commitment and then pursue that. And also I would say choose what you think you're actually going to focus on because it's really easy to get so turned around by the largeness of all of this. Mm -hmm. And we can't do everything. None of us, you know, our hearts and our minds can only hold so much at once and we only have so much capacity so I would encourage people, you know, if there's something going down that you want to address, maybe it's jail support. Maybe in your town, you can keep making phone calls and doing things in support of folks who've been arrested, trying to make sure they have folks picking them up when they get out. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, you know, as Miriam Kaba says, pick a lane and go. Mm -hmm. The work is there. We have to be proactive about taking it on right now. And this is no time for spectatorship. Mm -hmm. And like, it feels like we're trapped sometimes. Like I get... I get really anxious. I'm not used to being inside for this duration of time. And I feel very strongly that my place is in the streets. So it's hard to work with that. But, you know, when I became disabled some years back, I had to also get used to I didn't get to be in the street all the time. So I have some experience with this. And I know what it is to overcome that sort of feeling of helplessness, that feeling of despair, and to start becoming a problem solver about what you can do. Mm -hmm. And it's a great feeling when you get there. And 
And just like that, it's time for our weekly roundup of all the things we just ain't going to do. So I got to be real here. We are at a very dangerous turning point in this country, and we are teetering on the brink. What we are seeing right now is unprecedented. Uprisings across the country demanding that we take action to make Black lives matter. And a president who, as Issa Rae said, would rather call in the National Guard with tear gas and rubber bullets and tanks threatening thousands of people, he'd rather do that than stop police from killing Black people. And he'd rather do that than work to change the rules that are rigged against our communities. So here's my point. Lady don't like no fascism. And rather than fascism being a big word that we call mean people, fascism is literally a way of organizing society that is extremely dangerous for all of us. Black communities are in a fight for our lives, but so are non-Black communities under the current leadership of this country. And I don't even want to call it leadership because a more accurate word for this is cowardice. Every one of us gets to choose who we will be in this moment. Will we be the person who stands for peace at the expense of justice? Or will we be the person who raises our voice in support of those who have been rendered voiceless since this country was founded? Will we act out of charity to Black people who have been denied our fundamental right to dignity? Will we do that thing that too many of us do, shake our heads at how unfortunate it is that Black communities are under attack? Or will we say that we all deserve safety, we all deserve peace, we all deserve justice, and that Black people cannot and must not be the exception to that rule? Will you act to make sure that we all have what we need to live well? Lady don't take no half step in or standing on the sidelines. Now is the time to roll up our sleeves and frankly, get the fuck to work on saving this country from the hell that this president seems bent on taking us to. Here's what we want more of this week, though. One thing that Lady loves is people who join the movement. All across the country, people of all backgrounds are joining a movement to fight for the sanctity of Black lives. Not because it's a nice thing to do, but because they too see their futures as deeply intertwined with ours. There are so many ways to show up in this moment, and I'm going to make sure that we post a few on our social media accounts. But the most important thing that you can do right now is show up. What a time to be alive. There's more next week, beloveds, but for now, just know that I am here with you struggling to figure it all out, yearning for all that which we deserve, and more committed than ever to getting closer to it in our lifetimes. Kelly, you are amazing. You're amazing. How are you? No, you're so amazing. And actually, (laughs) you know, what's funny is I just want people to know, like, you and me became homies on the interwebs. I don't think we've actually yes, we did. I don't think we've actually gotten to like sit down and share a drink. It was planned pre-pandemic, but Lord have mercy. I think we might need to do no Zoom, girl, no Zoom. Um, we, <laughs> I don't do. I can't do the Zoom, but <laughs> any other platform, yo. Um, we gotta. We gotta wrap. Um, I would love it if you would tell the good people who are listening right now how they can follow you or be in touch. So on Twitter, I am at Ms. Kelly M. Hayes. And also on Facebook as Kelly Hayes. I have a website, which is kellyhayes.org. Excellent. Tell the good people where they can get a hold of the Movement Memos podcast. So our podcast can be found at truthout.org. Um, under, if you go to the series page, it's Movement Memos. And you can also find us on any of the streaming platforms, Apple and Spotify. We're everywhere. Mm-hmm. And you should be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. You are just honestly one of the voices I look to to figure out where to channel my rage. Well, you are a light to me. So <laughs> I'm really, really grateful to you. I can't wait to talk to you again really soon. Thank you for being on the show.
That's it for Lady Don't Take No. But I'll be back here every single Friday morning to accompany you where you used to have a commute. We appreciate you joining us and let's keep the conversation going. Tell us what's on your mind. Tell us what you like and tell us what you ain't going to take no more of. On Twitter, we're at Lady Take. On Insta, we're at Lady Don't Take No Pod. We're also on Facebook at Lady Don't Take No Podcast by Alicia Garza. We post ways to do something about the things you hear on this show on our social media. So if we got you amped up today, check out the socials to find out how you can take action. Please subscribe and leave us a review and let the people know what you've heard here today. Our producer is Phil Circus. Our incredible theme is by Latirix, and this pod is supported by the Black Futures Lab. I'm your host, Alicia Garza. Remember, not everyone is an organizer, but everyone can join and help advance a movement. Sometimes it begins with a protest, but most of the time, it begins with a new commitment to be better yourself in order to make the world better. That's right. I said it because lady don't take no. Lady don't take no shit and sis don't respect the sis to walk around like a woman is. She won't speak less of something worse saying don't play. The girl take herself so serious. People stare curious. She got a natural way. Her hips sway furious. Love y'all. Be safe. Turn up. <laughs>